Good afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, I have no pictures, so you'll just have to uh, deal with my voice for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, so the, the context of this is food reserves, right? Both private and public, and they're commanding a renewed level of attention, especially in a world of uh, high food price volatility. Now, in the 80s and 90s, public stock holding fell generally into disfavor, particularly with the worldwide failure of price stabilization schemes and developing economic models of understanding the role of private storage. However, in the 2000s, there is now a growing reassessment of public storage and, in fact, regional storage as a possible safeguard against recurring food crises. Now, the reassessment involves the idea that the, the private motivation and, in fact, efficient uh, conditions of private storage, as elucidated in, say, the competitive storage model, may not yield a socially optimal level of storage. I think this is now becoming uh, increasingly well accepted. Uh, in the case of extreme shocks, the intertemporal arbitrage function of private storage uh, may fail. We fail to address price increases because actually you can't borrow from, from future stocks. You can't have negative uh, stocks. Uh, not only that, the, the motive of intertemporal expected profit maximization may not be able to capture the humanitarian implications of extreme price increases. In fact, such uh, extreme increases could lead to starvation and death, to put it bluntly, of the most vulnerable. And in fact, a, a, a social breakdown, in fact, which is not factored into these uh, usual economic models. So with this reassessment, public stocks can be seen as being held in emergencies. So note that this new type of argument doesn't argue for using these reserves to try to counteract the price increases. Certainly, the price increases or some extreme shock could trigger the release of those reserves, but certainly there's no question about or there's no argument that they should be used to try to attenuate those uh, price increases. Now, to, in fact, there could be various delivery mechanisms uh, for these uh, releases, such as if you wish to meet humanitarian goals in the face of uh, extreme price increases, then the delivery could be in the form of targeted safety nets. Price stabilization is, uh, could, could, of course, be an incidental result of the emergence, uh, release from the emergency reserves. Uh, the commonly cited example is uh, what happened when Japan uh, was given permission uh, to release its large WTO stock in mid-2008, and that kind of popped the bubble in, in the world rice market at the time. So this was completely uh, inadvertent <laughs> on the part of that particular reserve. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the, the, the case of the regional because most, practically all, except maybe Singapore, national food security stocks, especially in Asia, uh, which I've studied in, in some detail, and I'm going to confine my comments largely to Asia, but I'll have a comment later on Africa. These are uh, still managed in a traditional way, uh, buffer stocks to maintain price stability. But there is a new regional arrangement in East Asia that could correspond more closely to the new thinking on uh, emergency reserves. What's more, you, when you have a regional uh, reserve and you use it to counteract uh, risk, then you get the virtue of risk pooling, particularly if shocks are not covariant uh, across countries. So you get uh, an added bonus in addition to just maintaining national food stocks for the purpose of national uh, level emergencies. That regional arrangement has been mentioned by uh, Maximo as the ASEAN plus three emergency rice reserves. Uh, it entered into force in 2012. It now has a governance mechanism officially launched in March 2013. So this is very new. And it's governed by a council of 13 members from the ASEAN plus three, one from each uh, ASEAN plus three country. And there's a host country. The secretariat is, uh, host, uh, is housed in Bangkok, which is also in a different kind of emergency. So after stocks right now is 787,000 tons. Actually, it's a bit, possibly a bit more than that. But let me just focus on one type of program, which they call tier. Uh, which they call tier one. And this is with respect to that 787,000 tons. This is earmarked for use of uh, emergency anywhere in the region, all right? Now in practice, this is not a new stock. This is a component of existing national food security stocks, 
but by the earmarking, so let's say China says, okay, 300,000 of my uh, local stock I will earmark for the purpose of a regional emergency. Uh, what is a regional emergency? A kind of pedantic definition is given. It is the state or condition in which an ASEAN plus three member country, having suffered extreme and unexpected natural or man-induced calamity, is unable to cope with such state or condition through its national reserve and is unable to procure the need through normal trade." End quote. Wow. So notice how carefully hedged that definition is. Uh, but that, that's, uh, that, that is the basis for the actual trigger mechanisms that were later elaborated in the, in the, the rules and procedures for the release of those emergency reserves. So to sort of obligate countries for the earmark of those reserves, the, the, the countries are um, intended to move into a system of forward contracts, where if, say, uh, I, as Thailand, I have uh, 15,000 tons earmarked stocks, I can enter a forward contract with Manila in case of emergency in the Philippines. So this is not a straightforward forward contract. This is a contingent forward contract. Let's say it's valid for three years. And if there is an emergency in, in the Philippines, then the Philippines can invoke that contract and there will be a release of the reserve. And the release is, under the rules and procedures, supposed to be done within a month. So the idea is this has to be better than a normal import, right? Otherwise, the Philippines will just import the, the requirement. So this is supposed to expedite and shortcut the, the whole process of negotiation and possibly food price spike stocks disappearing. This is not supposed to happen uh, in case of that, that forward contract being invoked. So that, in a nutshell, is the system for uh, tier, tier 1 uh, for the release of the 787,000 tons. Now, note the definition. If you were listening carefully to the definition, there was no mention there of a price spike. So it seems that price increases may not be uh, a reason, uh, a trigger for the release. But actually what happens is uh, the, the calamity, which is mentioned in the definition, is a reason for the release. And if the price is concurrent, then that could be um, um, a basis. Furthermore, in qualifying the rules and procedures, in monitoring and qualifying what do we mean by uh, not enough stocks available in normal trade, one of the um, Indicators of that is actually a rapid price increases in the world market. So in a way, indirectly, price increases could be used, could be invoked as a trigger for the release of the emergency reserves. So this, is, this might be uh, useful, carry some useful lessons for others, despite you know, very, very young uh, development, and it's just about a year old. Uh, the other emerging regional uh, arrangements might derive some lessons from this. There's a South Asia Association, SARC, I'm in a mental block. There is a South Asia Regional Association now. They have a food bank also. They might want to, to look at this particular arrangement. They have a physical reserve basis. You know, APTA is not a physical, it's a virtual, kind of a virtual reserve basis. There's also a proposed reserve for the ECOWAS, uh, economic Again, I'm running out of uh, ECOWAS. Look at Google it. Uh, it's for West Africa. <laughs> Outside of ASEAN, I'm lost. Uh, they might also, uh, they, they're still sorting out what kind of arrangement uh, uh, they want for their particular food reserve, but they might you know, look at this as a possible uh, arrangement advantageous for its cost effectiveness. However, it does have also its disadvantages. Whereas national stocking policies tend to be conducted under dedicated enforcement and generous financial support, the regional reserve is weakened by, just to be frank about it, a rather tepid commitment of the participating member countries. The terms of the agreement, if you read through it, and it can be downloaded in the ASEAN website, allows countries to invoke any number of exceptions uh, to, to, to be able to participate or deliver on its commitment on the food reserves legally. Moreover, all council decisions, including decisions on the release of the reserves, have to be achieved by consensus. And you're wondering, how can you have an emergency uh, by, uh, response by consensus? Right? Do you poll your firefighters in a fire station before you, you go out to, to, the, to, to, to the fire truck? No, it, the siren says, 
you should go, but that's not the, 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 the design of the reserve. So I think the reason for such caution is political. Uh, each after party is reluctant to acknowledge the inadequacy of its domestic response to emergency and its need for uh, external assistance, nor are parties, I think, willing to risk the political fallout from deploying national food stocks for somebody else's emergency. And then suddenly the world is in a crisis. So it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit difficult. Nevertheless, I think there's some reason to be hopeful. Uh, these kinds of integration arrangements, I think, is uh, effective in moving towards a more open and cooperative and liberal uh, environment in, in, in trade and uh, even in uh, responding to price shocks and perhaps uh, might form part of our future and present toolkit in achieving greater resiliency in global markets for food. Thank you.